The Video Game Rental. Way back in the 80s, I was a super young kid, freshly exposed to Nintendo as a pastime. The only video rental store that rented NES games was a place called Video Stop. It was something like $5 in 1980s money to rent a game, which is worth about $10.75 in 2021 money when I made this video. Video Stop had a very strict return policy. The game had to be back by 5 p.m. the next day, no matter what, or you would get charged for another day rental. I think we were maybe 10 minutes after the deadline when we returned whatever game we had rented and they charged us for another day. My mother was furious and tore up the video stop rental card on the spot. That was it for renting games for a while. At some point in 1991, a place called Bill's Video popped up in our neighborhood. It was huge. They had plenty of video games for the NES, Sega Genesis, and the newly released SNES. They also had a three-day rental. For a little bit more money, you got the game for Friday night, Saturday, and most of Sunday. This means you had about 15 hours of playing time in between meals and sleeping to beat said game over the three-day period. If you didn't make it, you would have to pray no one rented the game and saved over your progress before you could rent it again. There were only about 20 games released for the SNES at the time in North America. The five launch titles, a few side-scrolling shooters, a handful of blah sports games and other unfortunate releases, and then there was ActRaiser. ActRaiser was released for the Super Famicom December 16th, 1990 in Japan, and was actually one of the first five games released for the system. A November 1st, 1991 release for North American audiences still put the title as one of the first games for us over here, but definitely didn't get the same attention it enjoyed in Japan. ActRaiser was published by Enix, who were already famous at the time for the Dragon Warrior series, or Dragon Quest for gamers outside of North America. I always thought Enix had good taste in games, and the company merged with Square April 1st, 2003 to form Square Enix. Very creative name. ActRaiser was developed by Quintet, a game development company founded in April 1989. The main dudes in Quintet seemed to be Tomiyoshi Miyazaki as director, producer, and Maiseya Hashimoto as designer and programmer. Both cut their teeth on the WISE series and brought composer Yuzi Koshiro with them. Koshiro is a heavyweight in the video game music biz back in the 90s and has writing credits on the return of Shinobi, Sonic the Hedgehog, Streets of Rage, and a bunch more. He is still composing today, and many of his scores have been adapted for a symphony to play. ActRaiser was the first game developed by the company. However, there were several other notable titles, such as Illusion of Gaia and Robotech, until some point in the mid-2000s, when the company just kind of seemed to fizzle out. ActRaiser is kind of a two games in one type situation. Originally, it was intended to be more of an RPG game. Miyazaki had said in an interview, we were about 70% complete with it when the sediment emerged among us that, hey, if we're going to develop for the Super Famicom, we've got to do something really super. We made a big U-turn in our development, and ActRaiser was the result. The RPG we abandoned was meant to depict the entire life cycle of a planet, and when I think about it more level-headed now, I can see that it was a bit unrealistic for a 4M cart. This idea did end up forming the basis of Terranigma, said Miyazaki. Terranigma was a game never released in North America, but seems to have been well received in Japan, based on a quick peek at reviews and sales. There are two main game modes in ActRaiser, a platformer that has a very Castlevania feel, and a city-building god mode vaguely similar to SimCity. Part of me can't help but wonder if Quintet just took two partially finished games and smushed them together quickly to have something ready before the deadline for a Super Famicom release. There are quite a few sloppy little bits in the game I feel should have been weeded out during beta testing. That I'll cover later in the video. For now, let's just start playing the game. ActRaiser starts like so many other games of the time, with the title kind of spinning into action. Within seconds, you have the option of a new game or continue. I wish more games kind of stuck with this 
quick start approach. Instead of the multiple screens of developer, publisher, and any other company who put up money to make the damn thing happen. Anyways, the first screen opens with church music just pounding away, and you are looking at a little angel character telling you to name yourself. Now is probably as good a time as ever for a quick Rikus recap of the backstory. After an epic battle ages ago between the master, yourself, and Tanzra, the antagonist, the master is defeated and retreats back to his Sky Palace. Nintendo was always very careful not to go too religious in the games they licensed and developed. Although apparently in the Japanese version, the master was called God and Tanzra was called Satan. Anyways, with no sheriff in town, the evil Tanzra divides the world into six areas run by his six lieutenants. Several hundred years of evil partying down goes by until the master finally awakens. After entering your name, the little angel dude gives a bit of a spiel to kind of bring you up to speed about the whole monsters ruling the world thing, and that it would be pretty cool if you could do something about it. You then get a command menu, and this is kind of where the game starts. The first option on the menu is to move. In the sub-menu, you can either move the Sky Palace or observe the people. With no people yet to observe, why don't we take a spin around to check out all of the six areas? The Sky Palace can zoom in or zoom out, showing off Nintendo's Mode 7 graphics that they were so proud of back in the day. As you pass over the different areas, the names appear in the upper right side of the screen. We got Fillmore, Bloodpool, Cassandora, Atos, Morana, and Northwall. Actraiser is semi-non-linear. Fillmore is the only area the game will allow you to fight monsters in at the start. However, as you progress in levels, you can challenge the monsters in different areas. There is an order at which the areas unlock, However, as long as your level is high enough, you don't have to follow that order. The other menu options are kind of more housekeeping stuff, like status of the master and status of cities, progress log, which is the save function, and message speed. The message system seems to have been borrowed from Dragon Warrior, or at least inspired by. I strongly recommend you change the message speed to the fastest possible immediately. Not only is the sound of the scrolling text kind of annoying, but this game likes to talk, and there is only so much patience a master can have after sleeping for hundreds of years. Position the Sky Palace over Fillmore and select Fight Monsters. Our fave little angel explains if you destroy the monsters in the area, people can inhabit it again, and off we go. A glowing circular object falls into a gray humanoid statue, which then comes to life as the master. The timer for the level runs for about four seconds before the player can move the master. This is a pretty minor glitch, and I'm not trying to be a hard-on or anything, but still sloppy programming in my opinion. The controls are pretty stiff. If you jump forward, sometimes you can't move back in midair, like Mario or most other platformers. This doesn't allow you those last minute course corrections when jumping from platform to platform. Your character doesn't turn in midair, so at points, if you are trying to hit an enemy above you that involves changing the way the master is facing, it can get a bit tricky. Your main weapon is a sword, which kills most enemies in one hit. However, the range is pretty much right in front of your face. You can jump and attack with the sword, but you must attack before the apex of the jump. If you are on the way down and decide you want to whack an enemy, the character will not respond. There are magic spells you can equip later in the game, which are super helpful, especially during boss battles. You can also get an upgrade to your sword in a later level, possibly Link inspired, that shoots a projectile. There is a decent amount of power-ups littered throughout each level. An apple piece restores 25% of your power and a full apple 100%. A bomb will destroy all the enemies on the screen. Crowns and jewels are points. A heart gives you another life and a little scroll gives you another use of your magic spell. The first level isn't hard, but again, the controls don't react as smoothly as Mario or Mega Man or other platformers, so take your time Enemies don't dish out a lot of damage, however, there are tons of opportunities to take damage and it adds up quickly. After blowing them, the centaur boss of the first level, we are off to the Sim Angel mode of the game. Two lightning bolts bring two people into existence, ready to complain, and you get a quick explanation of what you gotta do. Each area has a different type of topography-related 
object that inhibits the people from building roads and houses in a bunch of places. Luckily, you can text the Sky Palace to send a miracle, such as lightning, rain, sun, wind, or an earthquake to clear whatever objects are in the way. Every time you send lightning or any miracle, the game explains what it does, asks if you want to send it, and then asks where to send it. This is another annoying part of the game I feel should have been caught in beta testing. There are a bunch of trees in the first level alone that need a lightning shot at them. Other levels have way more shit in the way, and you end up using the same miracle in a row like 30 times. Perhaps if once you reached the where to send the miracle and used it, you would have the option to use it again instead of having to hear the spiel about how lightning can destroy trees and do you want to send it for the hundredth time. Anyways, it costs SP to use miracles. I couldn't find what that stands for, and if anyone knows, please leave a comment. SP refills a little bit each time the hourglass resets, as does your health. The hourglass is kind of the round timer and also controls when more little people run out of the main building to try to build houses and grow crops. This brings us to the next menu item, direct the people. This submenu has building direction to tell your loyal followers which way to build the roads and listen to the people in case you forgot what they were currently complaining about. There are a bunch of flying monsters in each level that are a bit of a nuisance. Your little angel dude character can shoot arrows to kill them and you can also take damage from them. However, can't die. If you do lose all of your health, you aren't able to shoot for a while as the monsters ravage your poor little civilization. There are two different enemies in the Sim Angel mode at the start. However, later in the game, other enemies are introduced. The giant bat-looking ones can steal a handful of people from their homes, decreasing your population. If you make it in time, you can kill the giant bat and save the little people. The blue demon enemy can destroy homes by shooting lightning, and it takes a bunch of hits from your arrow to kill these ones. The enemies spawn indefinitely from circular layers with different symbols on them, depending on what the enemy is. The only way to seal the layer is to direct the people to build towards the giant evil circles. Once they reach them, they seal the layers on their own. After sealing the first two monster layers, your people start to build slightly better houses. The first shacks they build can only hold four people. However, the wooden cabin upgrades can hold six. By now, you're probably getting the hang of it, and the third monster layer should be a cinch. After sealing the third layer, the people People conveniently figure out how to build bridges, so you can cross the river to seal the fourth and final layer. Again, your peeps start to build slightly better houses that can now hold eight people. If you are a real stickler me seeks, or if you kind of suck at the platforming levels and need to train up and build some levels, now would be the time to start to destroy all the old houses. Your population will go down a bit as you roast your dedicated followers with lightning. However, your followers will build better houses in their place that can hold more people. In later levels or once you get enough SP, you can also use an earthquake to destroy the old houses. A giant hole appears in the western part of the map and one of your followers claims to be having terrible nightmares of a minotaur who wants to get all nasty up in your cute little town. I guess it's platformer time again. By this point of the game, you should be at a high enough level if you wanted to check out another area like Bloodpool if you are at least level 2, or maybe Cassandora if you are at level 4. I'm a huge fan of non-linear games and finding alternative routes to get to the ending, so bonus points for this part. Axe can get a bit repetitive after after six levels of civilization building and 12 levels of medium good platforming. The game does its best to come up with new challenges and secrets to discover in each area. And again, being non-linear, there is some replay value in coming up with alternative orders to beat all the levels. Some areas require items from other areas to progress the civilization, so there are even puzzle game moments. Assuming you held on till the bitter end, you are now faced with the last area, Deathheim. There is no civilization building part for this area, and it's a Mega Man style, one final boss after the other, Battle Royale. The final boss fight with Tanzra is kinda neat and gives a feel like a side-scrolling shooter at times. 
dodging all the projectiles and other hazardous shit he tosses at you. Speed running the game is still super active, and at the time I made this video, the record for any percentage was only a month old, held by SYN, who holds a ton of titles in all sorts of different games. His act racer time was 58 minutes and 12 seconds. For the completest gamer, the 100% category is held by Ludwig von Koopa at 1 hour, 26 minutes, 33 seconds. When I have played this game, it takes me closer to 6 hours, the fastest I can possibly go, so those are very impressive times. Actraiser is a solid game. The two different game modes was a unique approach even if it was just a mash of two half-finished games. I wish they had spent more time working out some of the kinks and annoying bits, but it's not enough to ruin the game enjoyment. If you haven't played it before, or it's been a while since you last saved humanity, put it on the list. It's probably not a stay up all night trying to beat it kind of game, but fun for a time waster a couple weekends in a row.